On January the 23rd, 1960, two men vanished beneath the Pacific, risking instant death to touch Earth's lowest known point. The world celebrates a clean record, yet 60 years later, even the best technology cannot agree. How deep is Challenger Deep, and can anyone prove it? The true story is not just a race for numbers, it is survival against pressure that can turn a hairline floor into catastrophe. Here is what nobody tells you about the deadliest contest for the deepest place on Earth. Don't forget to subscribe. At dawn on January the 23rd, 1960, the Bathyscaphe Trieste slipped beneath the waves, carrying Jacques Picard and Don Walsh into the unknown. Their mission was to reach the bottom of Challenger Deep, a place so remote that no human had ever seen it. For nearly five hours, Trieste descended through darkness and cold, its steel sphere creaking under the weight of the Pacific. The pressure outside climbed toward a thousand times what we feel at sea level. Inside, Picard and Walsh listened to the hull groan, and at one point they heard a sharp crack. A window had flexed but held. At last, the sub touched down on the silty floor. A cloud of sediment billowed up, erasing any view beyond the porthole. With limited oxygen and the ever-present risk of structural failure, they stayed just 20 minutes before beginning their ascent. When Trieste surfaced, the World Press hailed a new record, 37,800 feet, or about 11,521 meters. Newspapers called it the deepest dive in history, a triumph of courage and engineering. But the number itself was never as solid as the myth. The depth came from pressure readings and echo soundings, calculated with the best models available in 1960. In later years, as scientists refined the equations for seawater density, gravity, and sound speed, Trieste's depth was quietly revised downward. Some modern estimates place it around 10,916 meters, others a bit more or less, all depending on which corrections are applied. Yet the image of Picard and Walsh, alone at the bottom of the world, remains iconic. Their descent set the baseline for every claim that followed. It also left a warning, every measurement, no matter how heroic, carries the fingerprints of its time. At nearly 11,000 meters below the surface, the physics of Challenger Deep become unforgiving. Pressure mounts at a rate of one bar for every 10 meters of descent. By the time a submersible reaches the trench floor, the hull faces about 1,100 bar, over a thousand times the air pressure at sea level. That force presses in from every direction, seeking the smallest weakness. Engineers know that at this depth, failure is not gradual. The boundary between safety and disaster is razor thin. Every component on a deep diving submersible must survive these crushing loads. The hull, usually a near perfect sphere, spreads stress evenly. But even a tiny flaw, a misaligned weld, a microscopic crack, or a bubble in the viewport can focus the pressure and trigger collapse. Viewports made from thick acrylic or glass are especially vulnerable. Their shape and mounting must be flawless, or a crack can race through in a fraction of a second. Syntactic foam used for buoyancy is packed with hollow glass spheres. If manufacturing is imperfect, a single sphere can implode and start a chain reaction. Electrical housings and connectors are filled with oil or built to withstand external pressure. Any trapped air pocket becomes a potential bomb. The smallest oversight becomes a single point of failure. At these depths, when something fails, it fails instantly. The collapse of a pressure housing or hull travels faster than sound, reducing metal and electronics to fragments in milliseconds. There is no warning, no time for correction. This is why every deep sea vehicle is tested to destruction in the laboratory and why even the best engineering leaves little margin for error. The deeper the dive, the narrower the corridor of survival. Challenger Deep does not forgive a single overlooked detail. On March 26, 2012, James Cameron sealed himself inside the deep sea Challenger and began a solo descent into Challenger Deep. The submersible dropped through the water column for nearly two and a half hours, riding a vertical shaft of darkness to a place few believed a single person could reach alone. Cameron's touchdown triggered headlines, 10,908 meters, a new solo record. The number was everywhere, crisp and clean, as if the ocean had finally given up its secret. But the number came from a chain of sensors and calculations, not a direct measurement. 
Deep Sea Challenger's depth relied on a high-grade quartz pressure transducer calibrated before and after the dive. Pressure readings were converted to depth using seawater density, which itself depends on local temperature, salinity, and compressibility. Even small errors, one-tenth of a percent in pressure or a slight drift in calibration could shift the final figure by several meters. Cameron's team corrected for these factors using conductivity, temperature depth casts, and gravity models, refining the estimate after the dive. The headline, though, stuck to a single value. The instruments did their job, but at nearly 11,000 meters, their limits become the story. No pressure sensor is perfect. Each reading carries a margin of error, and every conversion from pressure to depth brings its own uncertainty. Cameron's dive proved that even in the age of precision engineering, the ocean's true depth is not a single number but a range, shaped as much by method as by courage. Challenger Deep is not a single hole in the ocean floor, but a chain of three distinct basins, western, central, and eastern, spanning nearly 20 kilometers along the trench axis. Each basin forms its own depression, separated by subtle rises and steep slopes. High-resolution mapping reveals that the deepest point is not fixed. It can shift by several meters within a small pocket, depending on precisely where a submersible or sensor lands. A move of just 100 meters, less than the length of a city block, can mean a difference of 10 meters in reported depth. Hydrographers learned that even the most advanced navigation and tracking systems must account for this complexity. The Western Basin might host one expedition's record, while the Eastern Basin, only a short distance away, contains a slightly deeper pit. The Central Basin, meanwhile, can easily be mistaken for the true bottom if mapping is coarse or navigation drifts. Early surveys limited by sparse data and low-resolution grids often blurred these basins together, masking the fine structure that modern multi-beam sonars now resolve. This spatial sensitivity means that no two dives are guaranteed to measure the same depth, even if both reach the trench floor. The challenge is not just to descend, but to pinpoint the exact location within this fractured landscape. For every claim of a new record, the question lingers. Was it the deepest basin or just the deepest spot reached that day? Victor Vescovo set out to change what it meant to reach the bottom of the ocean. Rather than a single, unrepeatable dive, he wanted a submersible that could go to Challenger Deep again and again. A repeatable platform each time with scientists, sensors and the expectation of coming back. The result was the Deep Submergence Vehicle Limiting Factor, a two-person submersible built around a certified titanium sphere, engineered to withstand pressures beyond the deepest trench. Unlike the steel hulls of earlier generations, this sphere was tested and approved by classification societies, its geometry and welds scrutinized for the tiniest floor. Between 2018 and 2020, Limiting Factor completed dozens of full ocean depth dives, not only in Challenger Deep, but at the deepest points of every ocean. Each descent brought a new opportunity to cross-check depth readings, revisit specific locations, and map the trench floor with ship-mounted multi-beam sonar. For the first time, measurements could be compared across different days, different instruments, and different weather. If a reading seemed off, the team could dive again. Vescovo's approach turned the race for the deepest point into a systematic science, one where credibility came from repetition, not just a single headline. In this new era, the deepest claim had to be earned, measured, and re-measured until doubt shrank to the width of a pressure sensor's uncertainty band. Kaiko, Japan's deep sea robot, was built to survive the full weight of the ocean. It reached Challenger Deep in the late 1990s, collecting samples where no human could linger. But in May 2003, Kaiko was lost. It did not fail from crushing pressure. A fiber optic tether snapped during rough weather off northern Japan. The vehicle, rated for 11,000 meters, vanished at just 145 meters of depth. Engineers traced the failure to surface conditions. Heavy seas and some strong current placed more stress on the cable than the deep ever could. There was no implosion and no hull breach. Instead, a single point of mechanical weakness failed, far from the abyss it was designed to withstand. Nereus, a hybrid vehicle from Woods Hole, faced a different fate. In May 2014, while exploring the Kermadec Trench at nearly 10,000 meters, Nereus imploded. Acoustic sensors picked up the violent collapse. 
Debris was later found drifting up from the deep. Investigators pointed to a single weak component overwhelmed by pressure. Both losses forced engineers to confront the reality that at these depths, the smallest floor, whether in a cable or in a pressure housing, can end a mission in seconds. Every number reported from the trench carries the memory of machines lost to forces just beyond their limits. China's deep sea ambitions took center stage in 2020 with the Fenduja program. Unlike the one-off feats of earlier decades, this was a demonstration of sustained national capability. The Fenduja submersible, built entirely in China, completed multiple dives to Challenger Deep, each one tracked and publicized by state media. Crew members, including chief pilot Zhang Wei and project leader Liu Kaizhou, became household names in China as televised footage showed the submersible's descent and recovery. These missions were more than technical exercises, they were national events, watched live, with official announcements celebrating each milestone. The program's approach was systematic, with repeated dives, careful calibration, and a focus on gathering scientific samples and high-resolution data. Each mission returned with more than depth readings, sediment cores, biological specimens, and multi-beam sonar maps that built a growing archive. The Chinese Academy of Sciences coordinated teams of engineers, oceanographers, and support staff, ensuring that Fenduja could operate reliably at full ocean depth, not just once, but as a matter of routine. By making the deepest trench accessible to their own scientists, China signaled a move from headline-grabbing firsts to long-term presence and influence over the mapping and study of the Hadal Zone. Life at the bottom of Challenger Deep is shaped by extremes. In the Hadal Zone, where pressure exceeds 1,100 times the pressure at the surface, only the most specialized organisms survive. Amphipods scavenge in the sediment, their bodies adapted to withstand crushing force. Snailfish, pale and nearly transparent, drift near the seafloor, their bones flexible and their cell membranes fortified by unique molecules that prevent collapse. Microbes thrive in the mud, breaking down organic matter that drifts down from above, fueling a food web hidden from sunlight. Collecting these creatures is a delicate operation. The abrupt change in pressure during ascent often damages or kills specimens, making it difficult to study living adaptations firsthand. Even so, each expedition returns with new samples, evidence of life persisting where almost nothing should. Yet the deep is not untouched. Recent analyses have found microplastics and persistent organic pollutants inside amphipods and sediments, proof that human activity reaches even the planet's most remote trenches. The discoveries are incremental, measured in molecules and genes, but they reveal an ecosystem both resilient and vulnerable, shaped as much by distant storms and distant cities as by the ancient geology of the trench itself. Stories of the deep ocean tend to collect legends. Challenger Deep, hidden beneath nearly 11 kilometers of water, has inspired more than its share of myths, tales of colossal creatures lurking in perpetual darkness, rumors of secret military outposts, and whispers of alien technology lost to the abyss. The truth is less cinematic. Decades of exploration by submersible, robot, and sonar have turned up no evidence for anything beyond geology, biology, and the slow drift of human debris. The seafloor is not haunted by giants, and it is not watched by hidden eyes. What draws these myths is the sheer inaccessibility of the trench, a place so remote that for most of history it might as well have been another planet. The real suspense lies elsewhere. Every claim about the deepest point is tested not by fantasy, but by the reliability of instruments and the rigor of measurement. The numbers that matter are not secret, just hard won, and always subject to revision as the map sharpens. In Challenger Deep, the unknown is not a monster waiting in the dark, but the margin of error at the edge of the data. Every claim about the deepest point on Earth rests on the map beneath it. The question is not just who dives the deepest, but who draws the map, and at what detail. Cartographers and hydrographers turn raw sonar echoes and pressure readings into digital grids, patchworks of thousands of cells, each one a guess at the true shape of the sea floor. The size of these grid cells matters more than most realize. In a coarse global grid like Jebco, each pixel can stretch 450 meters across, averaging out peaks and pits until the trench floor looks smooth and featureless. 
The deepest spot in such a data set may shrink by dozens of meters or even disappear entirely, hidden beneath the blur. High-resolution surveys like those from the Five Deeps expedition or Japanese and US mapping campaigns cut cell size down to 75 or 100 meters. Suddenly, the trench fractures into distinct basins and micro-depressions, each with its own claim to being the lowest point. The deepest pixel might shift by hundreds of meters horizontally, and the reported depth can jump by 10 or 20 meters, all because the map sharpened its focus. Control over these fine grids is tightly held by national agencies, research teams, or private expeditions, making access to the most detailed bathymetry both a technical and a political question. As the resolution race continues, the definition of deepest becomes as much about who owns the data as who reaches the bottom. Three numbers stand in the spotlight, each claiming the title of Earth's deepest seafloor. The Fenduja program, using pressure sensors and domestic correction models, reports a maximum of 10,909 meters, a figure broadcast widely by Chinese media after the 2020 dives. 10 meters deeper, the limiting factor submersible, piloted by Victor Vescovo and tracked by Dawn Wright, records a 10,919 meter maximum in the Western Basin, grounded in repeat dives and high resolution multi-beam mapping. Then comes the 10,935 meter mark, wrapped in a formal uncertainty band of plus or minus six meters. This number is not a single reading, but a product of standards-driven analysis, integrating pressure data, shipboard multi-beam sonar, local gravity models, and modern sea level reference frames. It is the closest thing to a consensus in oceanography, but even here, the margin of error is part of the answer. Headlines out sometimes shout 10,928 meters, a number that echoes through press releases and infographics. Trace it back and it leads not to a cruise report or a peer-reviewed bathymetry paper, but to a media-friendly rounding, an orphaned figure with no clear parentage in the scientific record. Each number carries the weight of its method, pressure-derived depths, acoustic multi-beam maps, correction stacks built on temperature, salinity, and gravity. The seafloor is the same, but the measurement and the claim depend on how you choose to count. No single integer settles the debate. The race for the deepest point is, at its core, a contest of methods and standards, not just meters. Today, even with all our technology, the deepest place on Earth remains defined by uncertainty bands, not single numbers. Each new map redraws the edge of the unknown. As nations and scientists race for precision, the real contest is over who sets the standards for truth. Down here, certainty is rare, and the pursuit itself is what keeps us reaching deeper. Share your thoughts on where exploration goes next. Subscribe for more deep sea mysteries and don't miss a single episode.